This weekend, it was our turn to have a party. About once every month and a half, six of us three couples used to get together at one of our houses. It was my friend Emily and her husband, Mike, our neighbor, Jessica, and her husband, Tyler. Sometimes there were others, but that was the main group. We were all in our twenties and none of us had children. There was food, drinks, and usually a theme. Sometimes it was a simple card game or a sporting event on TV. When we met at Tyler's house, we would swim in his pool, weather permitting. Emily and I organized these parties, calling each other to make sure we could get a critical mass together on a certain date. I loved to chat and gossip on the phone and enjoyed organizing these events. My family still lives in a coastal town in Oregon where I grew up. I graduated from a state university with a degree in finance and became a certified financial planner. I was a bit introverted but enjoyed learning about money markets, statistics, and the history of our economic system. My father sold insurance in our city, and his honest reputation gave me authority in the financial world of our town. I was named after my father, his name was Joseph Thompson, and I was JT. I started renting an office in his building and worked hard setting up meetings with people to explain my strategies for their money. I aim for their money to grow steadily but conservatively. I was associated with a national company and received a lot of financial data from them. I also did my own research and enjoyed it. My first year was somewhat successful, with clients making good profits and their portfolios beating the market. Sharing office space with my father helped, as many of his long-term clients became my clients. I made an effort to meet my clients regularly, get to know them better, and enhance my personal customer service. They valued this contact. However, it became clear in my second year that there weren't enough businesses in our town to make a good living. I had financial goals and realized I couldn't support myself with just local business. The weather was good for our party, so we decided to eat outside. We had a large terrace with a barbecue and an open kitchen. I asked Emily what she would like the theme to be. Let's play a game, she said. We're going to play a fun and funny game that everyone will enjoy. Doesn't that sound good, JT? She blurted out. There was a little competition to see who could have the most fun party. I just enjoyed the company, mostly food and drinks. I admit that I really like my wine and have had an extra glass or two at times. What game? I asked. Don't worry, JT, I'll handle it. You just get the barbecue ready, Emily replied. This suited me just fine. I started thinking about the group meeting that evening. First, there were Emily and Mike. Emily and I have been friends since middle school. Emily is a little plump but proportionately built and likes to show off her curves with loca tops. Mike is a diesel mechanic and works in a large shop in our city. He is good-natured and doesn't mind when Emily flirts and shows off. He's a big guy, probably 6 feet 3 and 220 pounds. I rather like him, but we wouldn't have been friends without the connection between Emily and me. Jessica and Tyler were neighbors, and I can't remember how we became so close. Jessica has a simple face but an outstanding body. Not as voluptuous as Emily's, but naturally thin. She's smart, and I find I have the most in common with her in our group. Tyler is a golfer, slim, and approximately 5'9". There's a certain arrogance in Tyler's demeanor that put me off at first, but I learned to tolerate it. I'm not sure I trust him, but he's smart, funny, and lively at these parties. Just at that moment, I heard the doorbell ring, and the guests started arriving. I decided to move my financial planning practice to the city. I joined the firm there but also continued my practice in our coastal town. It was only a two-hour drive between them. My plan was to spend one week a month in the city, staying with my parents and meeting clients. I roomed with a college friend, Julian Lee, who was in its specialist for a large bank. Julian was creative, and I was surprised by his career choice. We had a two-bedroom apartment in the Tranny Maples neighborhood, close to the city center. I could walk to my office, and there were plenty of restaurants, bars, and boutiques nearby. It was a young, modern, and hip area. It was at one of these bars that I met Emily. She worked at Lucas, a trendy restaurant and bar about two blocks from our apartment. The third time Julian and I were there, I started talking to Emily. To me, she looked like a playboy bunny sensual and beautiful. She always wore something that showed off her curves. Emily was tending bar, and we started talking. She asked me all sorts of questions about my life, career, and goals. I was a little surprised by how much attention she paid to me. She was great, and I was just an average financial planner. In high school, I had a girlfriend named Rachel Benson. Rachel was attractive, smart, and fun to be around. 
We tried to make it work during college, but it was too difficult. I dated a few girls in college, but never had a steady girlfriend. The night we left, I almost asked Emily out on a date. I got the impression she wanted it too, but I was worried she would say no, and then we would have to find another bar. Dude, she's hot, Julian said. You like her, you should ask her out. You think? I asked. You better do it quickly, or someone will beat you to it. Julian replied. The next evening, I went to Lucas alone and made a date with Emily for Sunday evening. We met, and I was a little scared because I had never been with such a beautiful girl. She showed that she liked me, and it didn't take long before she gave me what I considered the ultimate sign of affection. Sex with Emily was like nothing I had ever experienced before. I had several different sexual partners, including my high school friend Rachel. In sex, you could say I was a student, and Emily had a PhD. We did everything we could, and she taught me a lot. She was completely relaxed and beautiful, seductive and feminine. I sometimes wondered how she learned all these things and how experienced she was, but I avoided discussing sexual history, afraid it would be too painful. Any fear I felt was more than compensated for by my satisfaction. Everyone was sitting on our back porch. We finished dinner and drank about two glasses of wine each. I had a long discussion with Mike about his hopes to get a manager position at the diesel shop where he worked. He told me the owner was religious and asked if it would help to attend his church. I said if he wasn't religious, it might seem insincere. He said he would have to think about it. As we chatted lazily, Emily asked, so, what are our plans for tonight? Okay, Emily began. Be open-minded, this is just for fun. We're going to play truth or dare. I thought, oh no, but Mike, Jessica, and Tyler clapped and applauded. I looked at Emily, who smiled and quickly looked at Jessica. Mike and Tyler grinned. Jessica had a half-smile and was the only one who wasn't particularly enthusiastic. It started off mildly, with hints of innuendo but nothing too risky. Questions like who is your favorite movie star, and how old were you when you lost your virginity, were asked, then it was Tyler's turn to ask. He chose Emily, and she chose Dare. Emily, I suggest you take off either your shorts or your top, Tyler said. Wait a minute, I interjected. It's okay, I'm wearing underwear. It's like a swimsuit, Emily reassured me. Emily loves attention, and there have been times when her behavior has come close to crossing the line. While I like her confident sexuality, I don't want others to experience intimacy with her. She quickly took off her top and stood there in her lacy white bra, her nipples protruding through the sheer fabric. The tops of her breasts trembled as she stood up proudly, and Tyler and Mike whistled. Jessica giggled. Come on, girl. Emily liked everyone's attention, and I was a little angry but kept my thoughts to myself. The game continued without problems until Jessica dared to show her completely naked breasts. Unlike me, her husband Mike encouraged her. She flashed them, and everyone laughed, except Jessica and me. I said, one more round, and then the game ends. There were a few chuckles and protests, but I was concerned about crossing the line. It was Emily's turn, and she asked Tyler. Okay, go for it, she challenged. Show your tool in your pants for ten seconds, Emily challenged. Don't you dare, Jessica replied. But Tyler stood up, unzipped his pants, and stripped off his shorts and boxes. He was six inches flabby and not skinny. Both Emily and Jessica stared at him. Mike was laughing, and Tyler gyrated like a stripper. When I looked at Emily, she was just staring at Tyler. At that moment, Jessica said, I'm leaving. She looked furious and told Tyler to either get dressed and come with her or walk home. Everyone left, and the party was officially over. As we cleaned up, Emily was uncharacteristically quiet. I said, this has gone too far, don't you think? Oh, it was just for fun. Don't be such a stick in the mud, she answered jokingly. Emily, people were almost naked, and you were one of them, I said. Okay, I'll show you naked, she teased and continued undressing. I quickly became distracted, but I was determined to have a serious discussion about it tomorrow. The next morning, I got up early and went for a run. While running, I planned the discussion with Emily. I wanted to make it clear that while I enjoyed fun and a good party, our bodies were just for us. We made this vow on our wedding day, and I wasn't going to compromise. When I returned, Emily was laughing on the phone. She must have heard me because the laughter stopped and the volume decreased. I thought I heard the word embracing before she noticed me. Who was that? I asked. Oh, just Jessica. She and Tyler had a great time and rated our party the best so far. She giggled. About that? I think we should talk about last night and your behavior, I said. Emily, usually good-natured, 
got angry quickly. She insisted it was just fun, and no one was upset. I tried to reason with her and explain my feelings, but she wasn't interested. After our argument, there was silence. I spent time working in the yard, analyzing my feelings. I didn't think I was being unreasonable. I wanted to give Emily the freedom to be herself, but intimate moments should be ours alone. I felt unsure of myself. Emily was beautiful and sexy, while I was just a financial planner. She got attention from men all the time. We were invited to a casual acquaintances party the next Saturday. At that time, we hadn't formalized our exclusivity, but I thought we were exclusive. She said she loved me, and for me, love and exclusivity went hand in hand. It was December, and the party was a bit fancier than usual. When I saw what Emily was wearing, my eyes almost popped out of my head. It was a red dress that barely covered her. Do you like my dress? She teased. Emily, you look great, but well, that's pretty skimpy, I replied. You know I'll probably have clients there. And, well, it's a little over the top. Emily rarely got angry, but when she did, it was usually about her appearance. She thought I was calling her trashy and embarrassing. It took a while, but I apologized. Even though it was a bit chilly, we went to the party, and she wore the dress. The house was big, with beautiful decorations, lots of food, and drink. Some of my work colleagues were there, as well as people I knew from college and the sports club. There was a guy from college named Mike Harris, one of those confident, charming types. Mike noticed Emily and made a beeline for her. She attracted a lot of attention, especially with that dress. I became popular among colleagues and acquaintances. At one point, I went to get a drink, and when I came back, Mike was chatting with Emily, acting as if I didn't exist. She loved the attention. I managed to get her away, but as parties go, we drifted apart again. I was talking to colleagues about business ideas when I realized more than an hour had passed since I last saw Emily. I took a quick glance around the living room, kitchen, and family room. Nothing. I didn't want to seem worried but needed to find her. A group of people were smoking outside, so I stepped out into the winter air. No Emily. I was returning when I heard her laughter from the street. She and Mike were walking down the sidewalk. It took her a minute to see me. Oh, hi honey. Jim was just showing me his new BMW, she said. It's just amazing, Mike added. I mean the car, he laughed. I looked at Emily, she seemed a little rumpled. I forced a smile but was boiling inside. Emily hugged me as they approached. I'm leaving now, I said. Just wanted to make sure you needed a ride home. Of course I want a ride home, she said, looking at me questioningly. Mike slapped me on the back. Good to see you again, he said, extending his hand. I'm not a bodybuilder but I play sports and have a strong grip. My anger at Emily and Mike's audacity led me to grab his arm tightly. He didn't stand a chance and was already on his knees by the time he realized what was happening. Honey, you're hurting Jim. Emily cried. Sorry, my fault. I said and headed towards the car. By the time I got to my car and buckled up, Emily caught up with me. This was our first big fight. Usually, I liked her she looked great, and our relationship was beyond amazing but we had never had a specific discussion about exclusivity. I dropped her off, and she looked at me questioningly when I told her I was staying at my place that night. Oh, H, honey, don't, she said. Nothing happened with Jim. We were just having fun. Well, I think that's enough for one night. See you later, I said and left. She called and texted, but I ignored her. Life went on, and I focused on my work. The following week, I decided to leave for my hometown on Saturday morning instead of my usual Sunday evening. I called my mom, and she was thrilled to have me for the weekend. I had a good week in my hometown, meeting clients and achieving my financial goals. A week ago, I would have said my personal life was also on track, but now I couldn't. Emily continued to text and call, but my responses were minimal. She asked when I would be back, and I told her Friday evening. Before I could enter my house, the doorbell rang. It was Emily, wearing a raincoat and holding a gift. This is for you, she said, handing me the gift. I opened it and found an old-fashioned skeleton key inside. You have the key to my heart, she said. I stared at her with mixed feelings. She unbuttoned her cloak, revealing herself in a way that melted away my resolve. We reconciled, but I still needed to address everything that happened. I asked her about everything that happened with Mike. She admitted she went out with him, but insisted nothing happened. I've been treating guys this way since I was 14, she said. I told her I might be jealous but explained that I wanted a committed relationship. Emily reassured me she was committed and wanted to be with me forever. 
She was loving and attentive after that. Our relationship seemed to improve. I continued to watch, but nothing unusual happened. She was more attentive to me and seemed to interact less with Jessica. One Saturday, I was working in the yard when Tyler walked by. Tyler and I weren't very friendly, but we had a long conversation about lawns, fertilizers, and gardening. He talked about his children and ex-wife, explaining his custody battle. His affection for his children made him seem more vulnerable. Suddenly, he asked where Emily was. I told him she was shopping, and we continued talking about his custody situation. Fifteen minutes later, Emily appeared in a tiny bikini and greeted Tyler. She loved sunbathing in minimal clothing. We had a nosy retired neighbor named Henry Anderson. Anderson was a good guy who looked after our house when we were away. That's why I put up a screen to block his view. Meanwhile, Tyler tried to catch a glimpse of Emily. I led him to the exit, ending our conversation. As he walked through the gate, he called out, Need any help with the suntan lotion, Emily? This made me remember another incident. After the incident with Mike, things got better. Our relationship entered a new phase. I partly justified Emily's behavior by thinking we weren't committed then. Now we were devoted to each other. Emily was loving, gentle, and fun to be around. I hadn't had deep discussions with her like I had with other girlfriends, but we had fun, and she was beautiful. I was proud to be with her in public. She began asking gentle questions about our future. I thought about this myself. I'll make an analogy. I always imagined myself driving a Camry and suddenly found myself in a Porsche. I had this mental tug-of war. One part of my brain said she might not be the ideal match for me, and this fun was temporary. The other side said I was crazy to think that way. Every man's dream is to marry a goddess. What's my problem? The argument that broke the camel's back was this. If I broke up with Emily, would any other woman compare it to her physically or sexually? No one had come close. Plus, I loved her curves. They were amazing. I proposed to her and surprised her with tickets to a Caribbean vacation. Emily was delighted. She loved the ring, and the trip was only a few weeks away. Emily called her mom in California to share the news and had a long chat with Jessica. I called my parents, and they seemed happy for me but hesitant. Are you sure about this? Dad asked. Of course. Why the question? Well, this is a big step. Emily is wonderful. I'm very happy for you, he replied. I thanked him but sensed hesitation in his enthusiasm. The resort was amazing. There was a pool, plenty of bars and restaurants, and a private beach with loungers and umbrellas. They also had a beach sports hut where you could rent kayaks, jet skis, and other water activities. Once we got there, we changed into our swimsuits for a walk on the beach. Emily had three types of bikinis, hot, tight, and micro. I told her the micro was just for me. We'll see, she giggled. We grabbed drinks from the beach bar and walked along the beautiful crescent of white sand. Emily wore a hot bikini with a sheer white cover-up that hid almost nothing. Men and women looked at her, and I was proud to be with her. We had a casual dinner at the pool bar and a few strong room drinks. We headed to our room and watched the sunset from our balcony. Both a little tipsy, we enjoyed the moment. The staff at the resort were very helpful. There was always someone to get towels, give directions, or see if we needed anything. There were also young men called beach boys who patrolled the sun loungers. They probably worked for tips, catering mainly to women over 40 who enjoyed their attention. They brought drinks, towels, moved chairs, and applied suntan lotion if asked. Naturally, they were attracted to Emily in her bikini. She had moved on to her skimpiest bikinis, looking very sexy. One of the beach boys, Chris, always seemed to hang around. He had smooth golden skin, a lean build, and a sparkling white smile. One day, I asked Emily if she wanted to ride a jet ski. You go without me. I'm going to work on my TED, she said. I had an hour-long training session on the jet ski and had fun zipping around the ocean. When I returned, I saw Chris massaging Emily's back. What's going on here? I asked, Mr. JT, I don't want Miss Emily to get a sunburn. She needs sunscreen on her back, Chris muttered. I can take care of this myself. Thank you, I said. And he hurried away. Emily... What does this mean? I asked quietly, but firmly. Your top is open, and this teenager had easy access to your body, I continued. Oh, honey, calm down. He may have touched the sides a little, but they're just for you, she said. Her words turned me on, and I pushed aside my concerns. We headed back to our room. Eventually, the vacation ended, and we discussed wedding plans on the way home. Emily dozed off during the flight, and I reflected on our wonderful trip. 
The only lingering thought was about Chris groping her. After the weekend, when Tyler came to stay with us, life went on. Work was intense and rewarding for me. The money I was making wasn't bad. Emily worked at Lucas Bar, mostly during lunch shifts as a waitress. This allowed us to spend most evenings together. Emily didn't really have to work, but she liked having her own money. As summer began, Emily and Jessica started talking about the couple's next meeting. After the truth or dare party at our house, I hoped these parties would die out. After much planning, the next party was scheduled for mid-July at Tyler and Jessica's house, weather permitting. It was supposed to be a pool party. When I heard this, I immediately said, not a single bikini from the Caribbean. Emily responded, I can wear red. Absolutely not. No way. It's one thing for strangers to see you like that, but not our friends, I said. She said nothing more, and I thought the issue was resolved. On the Tuesday before the party, I got a frantic call from my mom. My father had a heart attack and was at the county hospital for bypass surgery. I told my mom I would come as soon as possible. I called Emily and told her what was happening. I rushed home, grabbed an overnight bag, and we headed to my parents. I tried not to speed, but I was worried about my father and my mother. By the time we got to the hospital and found my mom, things had improved significantly. My father had a mild heart attack, the surgery was successful, and his prognosis was positive. They wanted to keep him in the hospital until Thursday and then send him home. I stayed with him on Tuesday evening while my mom and Emily went back to the house to rest. They returned Wednesday morning. My dad was in a good mood, doing a crossword puzzle in bed. We hung out all day, and it was pretty boring. Emily was polite but didn't want to stay in the hospital for long. I didn't blame her hospitals are depressing. After bringing dad home on Thursday, I told Emily she could go home. She reluctantly agreed and left that afternoon. Most of Thursday was spent getting my dad settled, running errands, and helping my mom. I also spent time with my dad, watching baseball games on TV. Boring, yes, but I was glad to be with my parents. On Friday, I called Emily, and she asked when I would come home. I told her not until Sunday at least. How about the party? She asked. I had completely forgotten about it. Sorry, honey, I need to be here with my parents. Are you going to go? I asked. I don't know. Jessica wants me to go, and I think Jessica's sister and her boyfriend will come too, she replied. Knowing there would be newbies in the group made me less worried about things getting too wild. Okay, let me know what you decide. I'll call you tomorrow. On Saturday, my father was a little depressed. He overdid it on Friday and was tired. I hung out with him, fixed things around the house, and helped my mom. At one point, I noticed it was almost 10 p.m. and needed to call Emily. Hey, what's going on? I asked, hearing noise in the background. Oh, hi honey. I'm at Tyler and Jessica's. We're having a good time, she said. Just then, I heard a high-pitched scream and Emily giggling. What's happening? I asked. What, honey? She began to laugh. How much did you drink? I asked, you and, dear, the connection is not very good. Can I call you by? And then more background laughter. Suddenly, I heard Tyler say, take off that top, followed by more laughter. I thought, what the hell is going on? Her phone went offline, but it was obvious they weren't playing a trivial game. If I went now, it would be after midnight. I was exhausted and didn't want to risk driving home. I needed to know what was going on, so I called Henry Anderson. I explained the situation and asked him to take some photos at Tyler and Jessica's house. He agreed and said he would come immediately. I turned off my phone and went to bed. If something bad was happening, I didn't want to deal with it tonight. I was physically and emotionally exhausted from worrying about my father. The next morning, I turned on my phone. Anderson had sent some photos. They were worse than I imagined. In one photo, Emily was completely naked and Tyler was chasing her. In another, Mike was grabbing her. I didn't need to see any more. This was irrefutable proof of Emily's infidelity. I had seen the warning signs but didn't believe she would cross that line. It was unforgivable. A black fog clouded my mind. I told my mom I was going for a walk. Is everything okay, Jay? She asked. Yes, everything is fine, I replied, not wanting to burden her with my troubles. I walked and thought, tried and planned. Several hours passed before I returned home. I was deeply saddened but decided to end the marriage minimize my financial damage, and pay back those involved. First, I needed the whole story. I didn't want Emily to know what I knew. Emily called around noon and was especially kind. I miss you and your dad. When are you coming home? I really miss you and need you, she said. 
I almost confronted her about the party but kept quiet. I needed to make a plan to protect myself and my assets. I told her my father was getting worse and I needed to stay another week. Dad was actually fine and progressing well. I said it would be better if she didn't come because it would be too much for Dad. I left for the city on Monday evening and called my old roommate, Julian, to see if I could stay with him. He seemed surprised but agreed. When I got to Julian's, I explained everything and showed him the photos. He was shocked. He knew Emily was flirtatious but didn't think she would cheat on me. I told him how upset I was and wanted to get even with Emily and the others. I needed to hide what I knew from Emily until I had a plan. Julian agreed not to say a word. The next day, I waited for Mike at his work. He was a diesel mechanic, and I knew he was hoping for a promotion. I saw him walking to his truck and waved. Mike, let's get some beer, I said. He was surprised but agreed. We went to a tavern nearby. After ordering beers, I asked him about Saturday night. Just another typical party, Mike replied. Is this typical? I asked, showing him one of the photos. Hey man, what were we supposed to do? The girls took off their clothes. It didn't mean anything, he said. Okay, I understand. By the way, what would your boss say about this? I asked. Mike knew his boss was religious, and he was desperate for the promotion. He stood up, and I stood up. He pushed me, and I hit him. He immediately fell down, and there was no fight left in him. I've always noticed that bullies become cowards when confronted. Mike started apologizing and blaming others. I told him to shut up and listen. I had a few questions and told him if he didn't want his boss to see the photos, he had to tell me the truth and not let anyone else know. He agreed, desperate to hide the photos from his boss. We sat for over an hour, and I learned a lot. Mike told me that Emily and Jessica went to high school together. Emily and I started dating, but she had a boyfriend at the time. She continued seeing him for almost three months before breaking up. Since we got married, Mike knew of at least two other guys she slept with, besides Tyler and him. I was seething with anger but kept listening. Mike didn't seem to care and continued drinking. It was clear I couldn't remain married to her. I needed a plan. So, if someone came along with more money, a better car, and a better house, Emily would rush to him. I asked, sure, Mike replied. I sat there, thinking. After a few minutes, I asked about Saturday night. What happened to Jessica? Was she involved? I asked. No, Jessica took her sister home and stayed with her. This opened up the celebration for the others, Mike said. So Jessica doesn't know what happened? I asked. No, and don't tell her, he replied. Don't you care that your wife has sex with other guys? I asked. Wife, we're not married. We've been together for a long time, but when I get married, it won't be someone like Jessica, Mike said. It was time to leave. I had a lot to think about. Here are the key facts. 1. Emily was more than promiscuous. 2. The main reason she was with me was financial security, and she would leave for a better prospect. 3. No one except Mike knew that I knew, and it would remain so for now. I went back to Julian and told him everything. I was sad, but sadness gave way to anger. I wondered how many of them laughed at me behind my back. I had to make her and the others pay. Julian asked a few questions and then started working on his laptop. I sat there drinking wine and getting angrier. Julian asked, she never dated John Paul, did she? No, why? I asked. He shook his head and continued typing. Can you get about $30,000 in cash? He asked, yes, but why? I replied, I also need you to rent a BMW for six months if this all works out, he said with a sly smile. Finally, he outlined his plan. It would cost at least $30,000 and the lease of the BMW. He told me to go to Emily's house tomorrow and act like everything was fine. I had to go back to Julian's on Thursday after work when John Paul would be there. I called Emily and said I would be home that evening. I did my best to act normal. Every time she asked if something was wrong, I said I was worried about my father. Either I was a better actor than I thought, or she just didn't pay much attention. On Thursday evening, I met Julian and John Paul at Julian's apartment. After pleasantries, Julian outlined the plan. John Paul would pose as a New York investment banker, make Emily fall in love with him and his money. John Paul was two years younger than Julian, attractive, with long hair and a naturally charming smile. She would definitely like him. Do you mind if I sleep with her? He asked. I don't care, I replied. It can't be that they haven't had sex for five months. They'd rather sleep in five days. I gave them her bar schedule and told them it would be better if we met weekly. I didn't want to get caught, and John Paul had to act his part while I acted like a devoted, ignorant husband. 
The week passed without incidents. I tried to notice any changes in Emily. We had sex, but our relationship felt different. Living with Emily, sex was just a normal part of our lives. The good news was that making love to her wasn't slow and romantic but almost a physical competition. On Thursday evening, we met at Julian's apartment. I was eager to hear the report. John Paul said he had been to the bar three times. The first time, he just wanted her to notice him. The second time, like conversation and jokes. The third time, they met, and she told him she was married but hinted at problems. She seemed approachable. They made plans for lunch on Tuesday, and John Paul hinted he was wealthy, slowly giving little clues. Life with Emily continued, but I began to notice a coolness from her. On Tuesday, I returned home a little after 5 p.m., and Emily wasn't home. I went for a run, and when I came back, she was still gone. While making dinner, she came home. Hello honey, how was your day? I asked. Oh yes, I worked late, she replied. Were you busy? I asked. She told a made-up story about her work. I felt we were moving away from each other. The sex was still good, but looking back, it was mostly physical without much emotion. I decided to make it easier for her. I told her my father needed help, and I would leave on Friday afternoon. She made a half-hearted attempt to ask if she should go to. I told her it was okay, that I was just going to help out a little and stay the next week to see clients. On Thursday evening, John Paul reported that Tuesday's lunch turned into a makeout session. He called her on Wednesday, and they made plans for Friday evening. I felt like a puppeteer, pulling strings behind the scenes. It worked. As the weeks passed, their relationship developed. Emily and John Paul had sex the weekend I was at my parents. No surprise there. Our relationship at home was changing. She was moving away, and it was bittersweet. From time to time, I saw flashes of the woman I once loved. After about three months, John Paul began to swear his love to Emily and ask her to be with him. By this time, she believed John Paul was a wealthy New York investment banker. When he asked about her husband, Emily said almost nothing. She claimed the relationship was over and she just hadn't talked to me about it yet. A few weeks later, Emily told me she and Jessica were going to a spa in California for the weekend. I knew full well that John Paul had invited her to Sun Valley for the weekend. Of course, you'll probably like it, I told her. That night, I was rewarded with great sex. John Paul proposed to her at the resort in Idaho with a cubic zirconia engagement ring that cost almost $500. She believed it was a natural diamond. On Thursday evening, I received a report about the romantic trip. She accepted his proposal and told John Paul she had to break up with her husband. He wanted to get married as soon as possible. He told her he had to return to New York in two months and needed her to be with him. Anna told John Paul she would speak to me about a divorce this week. My plan was to fight her and act like I didn't want her to leave. The plan was to agree that I would keep all my assets in an immediate divorce. Everything worked flawlessly. When Emily told me she was leaving, I was shocked and saddened. We're married I won't let you leave. I won't let you get a divorce. We'll require months of counseling, I declared. I really excelled at acting. When she met John Paul at the luxury condominium he was renting, he reassured her. Anna, my love, I have all the money we will ever need. I have an apartment in the city and I am looking for a beach house on Long Island. All I need is you as my wife, he said. She could only imagine the dollar signs. This is what we'll offer your husband. My lawyer will draw up a document where he keeps all his assets in exchange for an immediate divorce, he continued. She was all for it. When she returned home, I alternated between being angry and begging her to stay. I kept telling her we needed several months of counseling before she left. I knew she wanted to leave quickly to be with a millionaire. On Friday evening, she came home with a divorce document. It gave her an immediate divorce upon relinquishing any rights to my assets. I gave the performance of my life, screamed, whined, and told her I would never let her go. Then I told her I needed to be alone in the basement. While she thought I was sad and depressed, I was watching a baseball game. Finally, with tears in my eyes, I walked out with the signed document. She had the decency not to celebrate in front of me. As she left, I noticed her triumphant gait. It was mid-September, and we were supposed to officially get divorced on October 5th. She gave up any rights to my assets and planned to move to New York to marry John Paul by the end of October. We met that Thursday at Julian's to plan the final act. The plan was for Emily to stay in the rented apartment for the next two weeks. On Friday, when they left, she would return to our house, pick up her things, and John Paul would meet her with a truck to move her belongings. By noon, when Emily was waiting, 
John Paul would already be gone. John Paul told her his last name was Taylor, making it difficult for her to track him down. It would also be expensive, and she didn't have any money. You're quite a cruel person, John Paul told me. I don't agree. This is not nearly as cruel as she treated me, I replied. I understand. I hope you don't mind me saying this, but I'm really going to miss her, John Paul said. Yeah, I'll miss this too, I sighed. My communication with Emily was polite. I had to feign remorse several times. I didn't ask her to change her mind and stay with me, afraid she might agree. On Friday, I met her at home as she was packing her things. I almost thought about trying to sleep with her one last time, but decided I'd had enough. She was dressed as if going somewhere special. She thought that was true. By 12.30 p.m., she made her first phone call to John Paul, but the number was disconnected. She asked to use my phone, with the same result. She called the luxury condominium, and they said it was paid for until Saturday and would be rented out again after that. She asked if she could leave her things while she checked what was taking John Paul so long. I didn't talk to her until the end of the weekend. It was time for phase two of the plan. I sent three packages with photos of the party, the photos showed Jessica, Tyler, Mike, and Emily clearly identifiable. Package 1 went to Mike's deeply religious boss with a note saying, I believe that the moral character of a person is reflected in the quality of their work. Package 2 went to Tyler's ex-wife with a note saying, Look what your ex is doing. Thank God the children are with you. Package 3 went to Jessica with a note saying, I think you and I missed the funniest part of the party. Sorry to break this news, but you deserve to know. Would you like to drink something? I signed all the notes with my name and phone number. I had one more piece of unfinished business, my caris. Maybe I'll ask Julian to come up with something for him. Of course, Emily tried to revive our relationship. No chance of that happening. She showed up the following Monday evening as if she had just returned home from work. Hello, honey. Sorry for our little misunderstanding. I'm home forever, she said. I just stared at her. Emily, you ruined my life, I shouted. This is not your home. You are running away with someone to New York. No, I changed my mind. I want to stay with you, she said. No more games. Forget about it. Get out of here and never come back, I said coldly. She resorted to her old tricks, already taking off her top. I've fallen for this tactic too many times. Closing the door in her face, I said, say hi to John Paul for me. I looked out the window. She stood with a blank expression, her beautiful face trying to piece together the meaning of my John Paul reference. In all our discussions, his name was always kept secret. Of course, Henry Anderson was leaning over the fence, watching. The last I heard, she was living with Jessica. I'm sure she's already looking for someone else. Mike not only didn't get the promotion, but he was also fired. He left town, leaving Jessica behind. Tyler was a different matter. When he went to a custody hearing, he was firmly denied. In fact, the court increased his child support and limited his visitation rights. The photos played a big role in this decision. One Saturday night, Jessica called me frantically, saying Tyler was coming to my house, drunk and with a gun. He had found out where the messages were coming from. I quickly made my way to the backyard, grabbed some blankets and pillows, and created a fake body under the blankets. I left a small light on to get his attention. I was armed with a baseball bat and hid in the bushes. Even if Jessica hadn't called, I would have heard him coming. He knocked on the front door and when I didn't answer, he walked through the gate into the backyard. He immediately noticed the setup and shot twice into the blankets. The first blow must have broken his arm. I wanted to neutralize the weapon. The next two blows were across his crotch. I also wanted to neutralize this particular weapon. Then I called the police. No special investigation was required regarding the weapon and the shots fired. I defended myself, and Tyler was charged with attempted murder. I called and thanked Jessica for the warning. You're welcome, she said. Now, did you offer me something to drink?